Do you love the weather? Well, I do. I know I've loved the weather since I was a young kid. In this podcast, I'll share my love of meteorology and how I got into the atmospheric sciences dating back to when I was just a little kid. My name is Dan Pope, and this is the Weatherman on Demand podcast. I'm now joined by Stephen Pope. Hello there. Hey, my son. Hey, Dan. Love you. <laughs> I love you, too. Um, and uh, he's going to tell his perspective a little bit in just a bit. But first, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, happened to me when I was a child. For example, I loved weather when I was about four or five. And I know that, Stephen, because I would be outside. There'd be a thunderstorm. I'd see the lightning, but I wouldn't hear the thunder. And as a very small child, I was puzzled by that. I wondered why did that happen? And then when I was about 12, of course, I was I had learned that thunder and lightning were at different speeds, but my friends knew I loved the weather because I talked about it all the time. They made a little jingle about me. Na, 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 na. Now stay tuned for Weatherman Pope. That's when I decided I wanted to be on television. Now, when we went hunting and fishing and camping, I'm, I was always watching the weather. I was less interested in hunting, although I love fishing. Your, you, your brothers and, and grandpa were constantly hunting. Yes, yes. And when I'd go, even if I carried a gun, I was much more interested in the clouds than I was in what we were hunting. Now, again, I love fishing. So, Big science nerd. Yeah, I love science. Yes, <laughs> I do. Anyway, um, one of my best friends had a, a father who worked at the metallurgy department in the, um, it's the uh, School of Sciences at the University of Utah. And above his level, that was the meteorology school. And he took me on a tour and I met all the people there and I decided I'm going to go to the University of Utah. Filled out a little application and uh, applied for a scholarship, forgot about it. Um, and then later on, I was a track runner and I also ran cross country and I scholarship to run at the school you went to, Weber State. I, and I remember that you told me as a kid, you were trying to decide whether to go get the meteorology degree at the University of Utah or go run at Weber State on scholarship. And if you'd done that, you might have been a track coach. I might have been a track coach. I might have been a science teacher, that kind of a thing. But the phone call came in. Grandma answered it. Is that right? Yes. I was in Alaska because I was, here I am a little bit crazy, but I took off during the summer of my graduation, went to Alaska to work, learn how to build houses with my uncle. So we're in a place where there's no phones. I, well, at least not at the house. I had to go down to the corner store just to get a phone call out. And I called grandma and I said, grandma or my mom, I said, Mom, I've decided I'm not, I am going to go to the University of Utah. I'm not going to take the scholarship to Weber State because I want to be a meteorologist. I love weather too much. And so a little bit later, three or four or five days later, the university called and said, well, they had a scholarship for me. And I'd forgotten when I went up to visit, I'd filled out a scholarship for uh, meteorology and everything is, is history now. By the time I was a sophomore, I was working at Channel 2 KUTV, and I was able to um, learn meteorology while I was also practicing it. And um, it was my dream to become um, maybe a television meteorologist, the chief meteorologist in Salt Lake City, but I had a long ways to go. That's the story before you were born. But after you were born, there were a lot of things that happened. And do you remember some of the things? Well, uh, you took us... You know, I was born in Medford, Oregon, mm -hmm. and I don't remember anything about Medford. You took us from Medford, Oregon to Atlanta. You worked at the weather station. The Weather Channel. The weather Channel down in Atlanta, up to Milwaukee at uh, Channel 12. Is that right? Yeah. Channel w -Y -S -N. 12. And then, uh, then we landed in South Jordan when I was about five, uh -huh. uh, and you worked at Channel 4 News, and you were the chief meteorologist there. And, and so... That was my goal. That was my, that was my ultimate dream job. And when I was a kid, I always noticed some peculiar things. I mean, it was normal for me to see because you did it every day, but somebody else's kid probably wouldn't see this. You'd constantly go out to the backyard and you'd be dumping out your rain gauge, <laughs> constantly measuring it yourself. I would, love, I would measure the rain. Now, when it would snow, I'd open it up and the snow would uh, be in the rain gauge because it had a top on it. And I'd pull it off, go inside, melt the rain down, and then I'd measure how much water was in it. I was crazy, right? And, and there was, you know, different thicknesses of snow, and you were always into that. It was amazing, and uh, you always built snowmans with us for sure. You tell me there was a story of, well, I remember there was a story when you came to the weather, when I was working to the weather office, and um, you plugged something in, and what happened? <laughs> I, 
I, you know, I don't remember the event. I only remember the story being told repeatedly, but something about me putting a fork in an outlet yes. and the whole station <laughs> power went out. <laughs> Ooh, so, yeah. Not a good thing. No. Don't recommend. Don't try that one at home. Uh, but but you, re- you remember it? I remember the story being told. But you don't remember. I don't that, remember so the sticking event. the fork in. Okay. No. All right. <laughs> now I got a shocking personality or something. But that's right. Well, something. maybe that's what got you so enthusiastic about being um, involved in a little bit in television. I did. I did history. follow your your suit, and uh, I have you know I have an architect personality, so I always wanted to do a little bit of everything, and uh, I followed in your footsteps. I always went down to the station and saw you green screening it. And talking like an Italian, looking out to your right, using your hands. And I can't speak without using my hands. Yeah, you're, you're getting Italian blood in you, even if you don't actually have Italian <laughs> blood in you. <laughs> Do you remember the time that we went, to, it was at KSL, when I was working there, and you came down to the TV station, I believe it was at KSL, maybe it was at Channel 4, and you were putting together your portfolio. Yeah. And we took a lot of pictures. We were at KSL at that point. Yeah. Um, so I have no idea why but in television they wear a lot of makeup <laughs> and, and so you you made me look like a white ghost as far as i'm concerned <laughs> and put me on set and i just i just i just you just did like a six minute clip from whatever happened on that night's forecast and just put me on set and went live but and you like that that was fun um you know i did you know this 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 podcast is about you so we'll move on quickly here but I did TV for you know two and a half years, and then I broke into marketing and left that field. The industry kind of died right as I joined it, unfortunately, um, and uh, I haven't looked back since. But you know, thinking back to when it was still in the heyday of weather and meteorology and television, mm-hmm. um, it really wasn't Christmas unless it snowed no, for you. No, in fact, back to when I was four or five, there was a Christmas when it rained. And I remember I cried. Was that depressing? I cried because, you know, I was only five years old, maybe. I don't know. It rained. It can't rain on Christmas. But anyway. Brutal. um, uh, Yeah. I mean, somebody who's really into it like I am. I love snow. And there's nothing like Christmas without snow. I mean, you've got to have snow for Christmas. That's part of the reason we moved eventually from South Jordan to the bench area, the high bench of uh, North Salt Lake in the Eaglewood Cove area. So we put a house way up there, high above up the valley, the up on the side of the mountain, for those of you who don't know Salt Lake City and the Wasatch Front. And uh, we built that house ourselves. We con- general contracted it and put it in such a way that we had views that were million dollar views of the wetlands of the Great Salt Lake and the sunsets were absolutely Great fantastic. Great sunsets. Oh, and I would, you, were, you were out on the deck constantly watching <laughs> The sunsets. I would. I knew exactly what time the sunset was every day, and I'd stop whatever I was doing, and I'd just go up and watch. I just I loved that particular deck and that that house. And and driving up on the roads up to the house, especially during the snow, was sometimes not even possible. No. <laughs> Did you get stuck? I I've not only been stuck, but I've also taken our old 1992 Dodge Caravan and did a 580 down Woodbriar Lane, um, and not intentional. Uh, <laughs> so, and somehow um, didn't hit anything. Yeah. You were very lucky. Um, there was another time, did you drive up over the top of a snowbank, or was that Matt? Uh, well, I'm sure we've both done it. I mean, driving in Utah Hills and in the snow, you're going to hit snow at some point. Right. Anyway. So I love the snow and I talked a lot about the snow and I talked a lot about the weather and one of the things that I did was I talked too much about the weather. And one time mom said to me, um, stop talking so much about the weather. And so I did. I stopped talking about the weather for a long time. And you know what happened? She, she, a bunch of people were always asking her what the weather forecast was <laughs> because she's the <laughs> wife of the weatherman. And um, so she came to me one day and she said, you know what, Dan? at least tell me when there's a storm coming <laughs> so that I can, <laughs> can talk about it. I, I can tell the friends and also, so I'm ready in case I'm out up, driving around. Up in so. Wisconsin, it was, you know, did you watch the Packers game? But in Utah, it was, do you know the weather? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know the weather? Anyway, uh, when I was driving, often I would be a little bit preoccupied with watching outside. You'd be watching the sky and mom would be like, Stop looking out. Concentrate on the road. Pull over, Dan. Pull over. She would make me pull the car over, and I had to sit in the passenger seat. She had to drive because I, and I don't mean that 
I do this all the time and that I'm a bad driver, but if there's a thunderstorm and I see the thunderstorm out there, I can't help but kind of peek at it every once in a while. Or if there's a snow squall coming in, I'm looking, hmm, wonder if that's going to hit us anytime soon. I'd kind of peek out and watch it. I am a good driver though, most of the time. And, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so I remember as a kid visiting the weather station pretty frequently and uh, you know, uh, I, I remember those big giant printers that would print out the weather. I don't know how to explain it because I'm remembering from like five or eight year old kid brain here. Mm-hmm. But uh, and it was always fun to like pull off the sides of the paper. Or the, yep. You know what I'm talking we about? We hung the paper. These were computer models that would print out for us. We'd hang them up on the wall so that they'd all be in order. They'd show us what the atmosphere is like at the surface, in the mid-levels, and the upper levels because meteorology and atmospheric science is a three-dimensional business. It's not just, you know, there's what's going on on the ground. What goes on above us is as important or more important. So you would go over there and pull those charts down and I'd have to tape them back up. What about what about this thing called lake effect? So there's oh, this big, yeah. great Salt Lake City um, weather forecasting that's the most unique thing in the world. Ah, it's as hard a forecast as any forecaster will ever have. It's easy to forecast I won't say e- easy is probably not the word. It's a lot easier to forecast Great Lakes snowfall for lake effect than it is the Great Salt Lake because it's so much smaller. But when the conditions are just right, when the air is really cold above and when the lake is warm and when the winds are coming in at the right direction, we can have a snowstorm of a foot or two feet sometimes. I measured one time in West, the west side of the valley, I measured 27 inches in 24 hours from a lake effect storm. That's a lot of snow. Yeah, and guess what? At the time, I didn't have a snowblower, so. Oh my <laughs> goodness, a, were you shoveling that? Yes, I shoveled. That winter, uh, we received, this is before you were born, Matt was born, uh, Matt's a little bit older than you, and you were born in Medford, we went from Salt Lake City to Medford, but I, I measured 194 inches of snow in Kearns. That was more snow than Mark Eubank had on the bench in Bountiful. He had 191 inches that year. That's a lot of snow. Yeah, it's a lot of snow. And that's the, that's the fun part of forecasting the weather, trying to determine exactly where is the snow going to be heaviest. That day it snowed 27 inches at our house. It only snowed one inch at the airport. And the airport is 11 miles away. That's crazy. That's, that's a big difference. So it's a little complicated in Utah yes. to tell the weather because there's so many different pockets. Yeah, mountains. We call them microclimates, up and down. Um, I, I always felt like in the, the cove that we lived in, we'd have a, a season that was like two weeks delayed. Yep. It was colder. And the it, also the snow came earlier. And yeah. the snow stayed later. And sometimes it would even snow close to June 1st. So everybody would go summer winter nope it's sprinter sprint yep so you have winter and you have sprinter and then you have uh, spring and th- then you have sprinter no, i'm sorry and then you have sprummer let me try this again winter sprint <laughs> there's only two seasons in utah it's it's <laughs> it's winter and construction, construction. who cares <laughs> the winter sprinter spring sprummer summer salt fall and winter and winter say that 10 times fast yeah those are the eight seasons in utah we have them all in one day sometimes i I remember you always had these weird weather gadgets some of them were toys in fact you had this like double two liter bottle and you'd spin it and make tornadoes yes the tornado love tornadoes i love tornadoes love hurricanes i don't like the damage they do but i love to watch them when i would go to talk to school kids i would always take the tornado with me and we'd spin it and we would have all kinds of fun uh, uh, results. You'd get a little tornado going. And um, I had a radio son, which is what the weather service sends up in a balloon. And it gets the weather balloon. And that's what measures the atmosphere all the way up to about 45, 50,000 feet, way up there. And then you know what happens when the balloon gets way up high? There's less air pressure. So what does it do? It gets bigger, 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 and then it blows up. It blows up? Yep. Jeez. And then the little radio son, the equipment, it comes down, it has a parachute. And wherever it lands, it says, if you find me, you uh, can put it in any mailbox or take it to any post office, and it'll be mailed back to the Weather Service. It actually costs half as much to refurbish one as it does to build a new one. So anyway, I had one of my own. Still do. That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. So, so as you started to build your weather career, you would actually have, I remember you would return, you'd, you'd get voicemails from people across the state and you'd actually like collect real data. Yeah. So you weren't just like telling the weather, you were actually like 
a scientist collecting information. Yes, absolutely. Saving that information so that at some point, if I needed it, I could go back and use it. And that's when I started doing consulting. I started consulting with a lot of attorneys and telling the story that happened five years ago or two years ago or three years ago. And we call that forensic meteorology. It's the same as forensics with the science when they look at what, what happened and how what a scene takes place. I go back and look at what happened in the weather and I'm able to tell that story in such a way that say a jury if, if there's something that needs to go to court or a deposition. And that's the kind of work that I've been doing for over 30 years on the side because I love weather so much I do it all the time. <laughs> and, and I know like when I was a kid, you would, you know, sometimes I'd need help with the car or an oil change or whatever it might be. I always would pick you over mom to go down and get the oil change because you'd get recognized and I knew we'd get really good service, right? Sir? <laughs> prices on everything. <laughs> um, and, you know, we never asked for it. It just kind of happened, but you had a little bit of a, a celebrity status. Mm-hmm. Um, and everywhere we went, people wanted to talk to you. Yes. Just and I, about anything. And I had to make sure, um, because I respect them, and I needed to uh, take a moment and have that conversation because they will remember it for a long time. I might forget who they are, but they remember it. And then they'll tell 10 people. And that's how you get your message out and how you get people to know you. Today it's a lot different because back in my day there wasn't social media, there wasn't there was there were computers, but very, you know, maybe boards where you could go talk on, but not social media. And I had to learn to change the way I did my weather forecasts and I had to incorporate social media and I learned to do it. And now I'm uh, I have a following that's as, it's the biggest well, it's one of the biggest followings in, in, uh, so, on my Facebook and uh, my Instagram of anybody in the state of Utah. So what's your favorite kind of weather? You got snow, sleet, <sighs> hail, rain, sun. What, what, what one's your favorite? I love snow. I love to watch the snow, and I love to forecast the snow. But honestly, I like the longer days of summer, and I'm, sometimes the shorter days of winter are a little bit um, a little depressing. depressing. <laughs> yeah. So, but that the love of snow helps me get through the, those depressing moments. I the say, I'd say the next thing would be a good thunderstorm and one that has a lot of heavy rain, some hail, and a lot of lightning and thunder. I love to watch lightning, but I also respect lightning because a storm can form and you can literally have a piece of lightning come out 15 miles away from the storm. In fact, this is a cool thing that happened just in the last week, week and a half, they measured using the satellites a lightning strike in Brazil that went 742 miles. That's incredible. Yeah. I, That's it traveled. Big... They, they were able to, to verify through satellite data because now the satellites are a lot more complex. They can still It's like the more. size of like a Jupiter storm. Holy crap, 700 yeah. miles. It's the all time record. So, anyway, I say that, you know, people wonder. Why did the lightning hit them and there wasn't any thunder or lightning beforehand? It's the first it, strike. It was like go. a state over. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, could, it could be from a thunderstorm way over on the uh, other side of the valley or over the mountain. And the same thing happens at the end of the thunderstorm. You think it's all over with, the lightning's finished, the hail and the rain have come by, and all of a sudden it's a lightning strike. And lightning kills a lot of people, so we have to be respectful. Uh, in fact, in northern India, three weeks ago, 148 people were killed in a series of lightning strikes in northern India because they were out working in the fields and they couldn't get to cover. That's what happens. That's how dangerous it can be. So on the back to the lighter side. So when we were <laughs> when we were kids, you always took us skiing. Oh yes, because you love the snow so much. So you taught us to ski, and it was like, okay, now everybody, five-year-old Stephen, take your take your skis and make little little pizza shapes and That's go down right. go down the mountain pies. Pies, pies, if you will, pizza pies. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you just loved going down the slopes all the time. Now, I took you on a big, steep slope at Snowbird. Do you remember that day? And <laughs> if I remember the right day, there was a snowboarder that came in and, and like, knocked me off the side of the mountain. It was not good. <laughs> and what did I do? I ended up picking you up, putting your skis. I was to the, done. To the I was done for that the day. It. That was he, it. He was finished. So um, I, I skied down the hill with him, but... I taught everybody, all, all, all three of you, the, the, how to ski. And mom didn't really like to ski because she didn't like the cold. And I think, honestly, you don't like the cold. I don't like the cold. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a snake. I'm a <laughs> cold-blooded, like, <laughs> what did you tell move me? down to the state of Georgia, get in the warm yeah. weather. What did you tell me when you were younger? 
I am going to move closer to the ocean. I'm going to move away from the cold and the snow. I, I don't remember saying these things, but it is something I would say. <laughs> yes, yes. That's why you live in a warmer climate. So um, it doesn't surprise me. But anyway. What, did I say, did I make any other predictions about my life? Tell me these things. <laughs> well, well um, I think that there were some clear indications that you had some, uh, you were very smart and that you had a lot of good things going for you. You knew how to take you would always play Warcraft, and I wondered why were you playing Warcraft. And you said to me that playing Warcraft would help you in your business someday. It's like running a micro economy, yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I, 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 honestly, I'm totally blown away by how successful you've been at my Amazon guy, which is right behind us. You're that the company, and you're helping me now because I'm out. I'm I'm not doing television anymore. But I still love the weather, and I want to finish my career doing the weather the way that I like to do the weather. So I'm trying to find businesses and uh, those that need specialized forecasting or historical weather information. Um, you know, if any of you can help me with uh, these businesses, introduce me to uh, my, or I'll introduce them and you to my email, dan at weathermanondemand.com. For example, if you uh, know a lawyer working on a case that involves weather, forensic weather, or an energy company that needs a forecast, a ski resorts, transport, aviation, uh, railroads, outdoor events, tourism, movie making, whatever it is, I really would appreciate you continuing, uh, helping me continue my weather career. My, my name is Dan Pope, and I'm your weatherman on demand.